One. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. It's good to be back. I want to thank Kelly and everybody else for holding down the fort while I was gone. It's easy for them. I think it's easier for them when I'm not here sometimes. <laughs> um, I want to have a, give, give you a couple of announcements, just three, three kind of big announcements. Tonight at 6 o'clock here at the church over in the, in the Family Life Center, we're going to be showing a movie. It's about the youth movement with, for uh, the youth movement about climate change, and so kind of how all around the world teenagers and children are leading the movement to save our planet. And so that will be tonight at six o'clock. I would encourage you to come to that. If you can't make it to that, today is May first, so happy May Day, everyone. But also, um, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and so Kelly is going to be leading a mental health discussion group at Barnes & Noble at Coronado, and that's tonight at 7. So you have some options tonight of things to do to gather together with your faith community. So at 6 o'clock, you can come here and, and watch a film. I'll be here for that, and I um, hope, hope I get to see a lot of you here. And if you don't, if you're not interested in that, you can meet Kelly at seven at Barnes and Noble at Coronado for a discussion around mental health awareness. And then every Tuesday at six for the next, uh, you know, six or seven weeks, we're having uh, ministry nights. And so we're doing like a, a financial health class. We're doing a class on the history of Methodism. I'll be teaching that this week. We're having a confirmation class. So if you no uh, teenagers who have not been confirmed who are interested in that, they can still jump into that class. Uh, there's a class on getting your house in order, so if you don't have a will or you need to update your will or you haven't done any kind of funeral planning to help your family out with those sorts of things, uh, you might want to attend that. That's, going to, that's a good one. There are several options for things to do. There's stuff going on for children on Tuesday nights, so this is a hopping place, and I hope that you'll uh, join in some of those ministries on Tuesday. So climate change movie tonight at 6, mental health discussion group at Barnes & Noble at 7 tonight, and then Tuesdays at 6 o'clock. Um, and you are in for a treat this morning. I heard the choir rehearsing earlier, um, and we have a guest here from JFON, which is Justice for Our Neighbors. She's going to be talking about some of the work that they do. I think that will be interesting for you as well. So uh, at this moment, I would encourage you to kind of get yourself centered, uh, put your feet flat on the floor in front of you, pay, take a big deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. Remember, all of the worries that you have for this upcoming week, you can't do anything about them right now. So right now is a time that we want to center ourselves and experience the grace of God that we have all found in Jesus Christ.
And if you will please stand for our call to worship. The winds of change blow. The Spirit of God breathes. The dead bulbs burst blooms. Lilies, tulips, it's spring. Refreshening raindrops moisten parched mouths of graves. O God of Calvary, O risen Christ, O Holy Spirit, we are so closed-minded, we do not feel your movement. We are so closed-hearted, we do not see your blossoms of love. We have closed our doors and become tombs of apathy. Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed. And if you will please remain standing for our hymn of preparation, Jesus Shall Reign. You may be seated. 
Would you bow your heads for our opening prayer, please? Oh God, we come to you this morning and come to this place to gather in hopes of feeling your spirit move amongst us. We gather in hopes of being changed by your presence and by being in the presence of one another. We gather knowing that the world or outside of this place and that surrounds us is trying to pull us into a place of disunity when what you're asking for is unity in love and in spirit so that we can go forth and change the world. Oh God, this morning, be with us. Shape us and change us and challenge us and move us so that we can become more of the people that you have called us and created us to be. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who, when asked how we ought to pray, said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's take a moment this morning before we get into all of the other things we need to do to take a moment to cleanse our souls. I think of the time of confession as a time for us to do the work of cleansing out the things we need to create more space for God's spirit. This isn't necessarily a time of personal confession as much as it is a time of corporate confession and recognizing the ways in which all of us have somehow participated in doing harm to God's creation, whether that be people or places. So let's take a moment to confess our sins before God and before one another. God of forgiveness, hear now the confession of our sins. Our Our greed greed and and our our lust lust for for power power create enemies enemies where we we should should find friends. friends. We fail to offer comfort and aid to those who are afraid and beat down by the burdens of life. We We are are as blind blind and willful as Saul to the the pain and the destruction destruction of our our wrongdoings and our our well-meaning crusades. Forgive us, merciful one. Give us sight to see with your eyes that we may bring hope and peace to our world. Amen. Amen. Family of God, God's anger lasts but a moment, but God's favor lasts beyond a lifetime. The Lord forgives our shortcomings and sends deliverance through Christ, just as the Lord forgave Saul and used him to spread the gospel. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Amen.
told you. I heard them rehearsing. I knew, I knew. You, I mean, you got to be kidding me, right? Like, Kathy, you were the only one dancing. I don't understand. Like, you, all of us should have been dancing, I feel like. That was great. And just the idea that, like, we want to live where God can use us anytime and anywhere. Great message, too. The scripture this morning is found in Acts chapter 9. If you've brought your own Bible and you'd like to read along, um, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Um, If you haven't brought your own Bible, you can follow along on the screens. I always, well, I shouldn't say always, most of the time I use the Common English uh, Bible for preaching because it's this academic translation that is translated in such a way that um, it's easily read verbally and understood that way. So this is... Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. It's the story of Saul's conversion. You may be familiar with that. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that the way is what they called the early followers of Jesus. He got letters to search out and find anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, Ananias answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is there praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for me. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road when you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the word of God for all of God's creation. Thanks be to God. May God give us wisdom and courage for interpretation, and may God give us wisdom and courage as we do our best to apply the truth of Scripture to our lives. Amen. This is a strange passage, I feel like, to preach from because uh, we've heard the story, a lot of us who've grown up in church or have spent much time around church, we've heard this story of Saul's conversion so much that it just kind of falls on deaf ears sometimes. We, we miss the layers of truth that are in it and the layers of active movement of God as we read this story and hear it read to us. 
So I'm hoping that this morning you'll be able to maybe see it and hear it with new eyes and that hopefully God will inspire us as a community of believers in the way of Jesus to do something. Saul was a Pharisee. He was highly educated, he was highly thought of, he was a leader within his own movement, his own religious uh, circles. He was one of the main leaders of, of what he was doing. He was highly motivated to make a name for himself and he was also really good at his way of living out his faith. He was on horseback most likely with some of his disciples because he was a rabbi and any good rabbi in ancient times had disciples, men and women who would follow them around, who were invited to follow them around because that rabbi felt like he saw gifts in them to do exactly what the rabbi was doing. So when Jesus called people and said things like, drop your nets and come and follow me, it's because something Jesus knew about them or us made Jesus believe that they, or us, can do the kinds of things that Jesus did. In fact, Jesus, near the end of his ministry on earth, said, you will do even greater things than I have done. Imagine that. Jesus has faith in us. He believes in us. He wants to encourage us and inspire us. So Saul and his disciples have permission to go and seek out these people called the way. They were typically Jewish people who believed that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, the God in flesh on earth who came to teach and love and show us what God's grace looks like and was raised from the dead. And so they started this alternative movement within Judaism and Saul and his cohorts were afraid of the change. Now I know... Nobody, at least in the United States, is afraid of change. But you know of people who are. He had permission to go and seek these people out and arrest them. I don't know what would happen to them once they were arrested, although we do know that Saul of Tarsus was there when the first disciple of Jesus beyond Jesus was stoned to death. So there's a good chance that if he found you, it was a death sentence. They're on the road on their way to Damascus to go find these people called the Way who were causing problems apparently in the synagogues. And something happened. Saul had an encounter with Jesus and fell to the ground, fell off of his horse and heard the voice of Jesus call him to a different way of being. It was a conversion. It was a time of change in his life. And fortunately, it would not be the last one. If you read in Paul's writings, he's constantly having these encounters with Jesus that have changed him and would continue converting him to be more and more like the person Jesus had created him to be. I wonder what his disciples were thinking. They heard the voice, but they couldn't see anything. And then they help him as, a, as he has fallen blind to get to a place where he told them they needed to go. And he was there and he was fasting and he was praying. And I wonder what the conversations were like when he was in the other room and they couldn't hear, he couldn't hear them. I wonder if they were scared. I wonder if they were excited. I wonder if they were getting their resumes ready, ready to start showing to other rabbis. I wonder if they too were converted in that experience. And I wonder about Judas, whose house they were at. What was his story? What was going on with him? And then there was Ananias. We're told Ananias was a disciple. He was a follower of the way. And he had this moment, this conversion experience 
where God told him, go to Straight Street to Judas' house, and there's going to be a man there named Saul, and Ananias knew who this was and was resistant to God's Spirit leading him in that direction. Now, I know none of us have ever resisted the Spirit of God in any way possible, but you might know people who have. But he was converted And again and again and again, that happens in our lives. Where God is calling us to be something more than what we currently are, and it feels like a conversion again. I don't know if Saul, I don't know what was going on with Saul while he was riding that horse, but I feel like something aligned in his soul where he was able to receive the blessing instead of resisting the blessing. There's this story in the Old Testament, you might know it, it's a story of Jacob. And he falls asleep and he has this vision or this dream of angels going up and down a ladder and then he interprets the next morning when he wake up, wakes up the meaning of it and he says these powerful words. Surely the Lord was in this place and I didn't know it. Have you ever had that experience? Where something aligns in your soul and you find yourself in a place where you can recognize the presence of God in a time and in a place where you didn't know it. I, I, I wanna let you, I wanna remind you that the psalmist tells us that from the depths of the deepest sea to the heights of the highest sky, as far as east is from west, there is not a single place that God's spirit isn't already there. We call that in Methodist world prevenient grace. The grace of God that goes before us. Sometimes it's hard to find it and see it and feel it, but it's there. Sometimes it's up to us to align things, to allow alignment to happen so we can recognize it. And sometimes it feels like God just does the work of a chiropractor and aligns our spirits and our souls so that we can know God's presence. I think all of these people had a conversion experience. I think Saul had one, I think his disciples had one, I think Judas who lived on Straight Street had one, I think Ananias had another revelation of what God's grace can be like, and I also think because Ananias was afraid he didn't go alone to Straight Street, I don't know what kind of crazy person goes to scary places by themselves, but I'm not crazy enough to have that kind of courage. Maybe you are, or maybe you know people who are, But for me, if I know I'm going into a place that I'm nervous about or I'm a little bit scared of, I'm always inviting somebody to go with me because uh, having somebody with me helps calm my spirit and brings me courage because I forget that I'm never alone. Ananias probably had some sort of conversion experience. We know it when it's happening. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to officiate a wedding that was three years in the planning. Uh, This couple has known each other for 17 years. They're somewhere and they're probably, (laughs) I don't wanna guess their age. They're, They're in their retirement ages. And the wedding was beautiful. They, they, I was joking around like, oh, we got these crazy kids married because they did the whole thing. I mean, they had the flower person and the ring bearers and they had the music and they had the whole thing just like 25-year-olds do when they get married. They had a big reception after the wedding and I was standing um, looking out at Red Hot Golf Course at the re- in Las Cruces at the reception and this man walks up to me and he said, man, I... I am not a church goer at all. I, I, I haven't been to church. I don't know the last time I went to church, but something happened while I was there that was really interesting, and I don't know what it was, and I said, you should go to church. <laughs> and he was like, well, I haven't been to church. And I was like, well, the thing happened because you should go to church. And then we got interrupted, 
and an older man who I had sat with the night before at the rehearsal dinner walks up to me and he said, you know, I, I was raised Lutheran and I married a Catholic woman and we started going to the Catholic church. I mean, kind of familiar, right, to some of us. And we started going to this Catholic church and um, my kids graduated and moved away and we haven't been to church for a long time and I was sitting in church today and I realized something's missing and I don't know what to do about it. And I said, you should go to church. Well, how do you know? I said, you just said you were in church and you realized something was missing. You should go to church. And he said, well, I live in Florida. And I was like, well, that, I mean, <laughs> they have churches in Florida. What was happening was this alignment. They had bit, put themselves in a place and were open to receiving and God had aligned their spirit and soul and their head and everything where they could receive something but for whatever reason, they were wanting to resist it, like Ananias. But when Ananias decided, okay, I'll receive, I'll go, I'll do, I, I, wish, I wish we knew the rest of his story because I guarantee you, he was blown away by God's grace in that moment. There is no way that that was not an entire life-changing moment for him. Imagine Dodie of you heard the voice of God saying, go to Rio Grande Boulevard to this particular address. There's going to be a person there. And you think you're going crazy, but you go anyway, and the person is there. That would change your life. And not for the worse. But here's what happens when we have those conversion experiences. Oftentimes, we start to doubt ourselves. Bishop Will Williman, anybody heard of him? Retired preachers, you better raise your hands. <laughs> Bishop Will Williman, I heard him say one time, at what my wife said, the nerdiest thing I've ever gone to is the festival of homiletics. <laughs> A festival of preaching. He said, if the you of 10 years ago is not calling the you of today a heretic and vice versa, you're probably doing it wrong. The meaning being that when we are being sanctified and God is moving us forward in our discipleship, we will change to the point that maybe we wouldn't even recognize who we were and that person might not recognize who we are because God's grace has shaped us and changed us that much. But we have to be open to the movement of the Spirit in that way. But that's not the end. Because Saul didn't have this conversion experience, and that's the end of the story. Saul's conversion experience created a vocation for him, or changed his vocation. Ananias had a conversion experience that I would bet changed his life to the point that his vocation changed. And when I say vocation, I'm not talking about a job. I'm talking about a voice. The word vocation has the same root as the word voice. So you can have a job that is your vocation. You can have a job that lets your life speak. Or you can have a job that provides income for you and provides resources so that you can do your vocation, which is where your life speaks, your voice comes forth through your living. Saul would have called himself a heretic three days before when he started following in the way. And he found a vocation. And because of Ananias' faith and Saul's faith and the disciples' faith and Judas, who lived on Straight Street, offering a place of hospitality, is, was anybody here born into Judaism? Because of those people, we are here. We are all Gentiles. Our conversion experiences, our growing in our faith, our deepening of our discipleship, that's not the end, that's not the point. The point is so that we can move forward in faith, right Wayne? So that we can move forward and change the world through the voice 
that Jesus gives us. And it can be small things, like offering a place of hospitality. It can be small things like being kind to your neighbors. It can be small things like forgiving that person again. Have you ever had that experience where you forgive somebody and then you forget that you forgave them and you have to forgive them again and then somehow it builds up again and you have to forgive them again? Jesus' disciples talked about that and they said, Lord, how many times do we have to do this? Larry, do you remember? 70 times seven, endlessly. Maybe that's your vocation, is to remember that. And through forgiving 70 times seven, you're able to bring more hope to the world and you enter into the world with grace and love in a different way and that changes things. Maybe, maybe your conversion experiences lead you to a call to ministry and you've retired and you think, I can't do that. Yeah, you can, we can find a place for you to serve. Or maybe you're in middle school or high school. I see three or four of you. And your conversion experiences make you start considering doing what your mom or your dad does. <laughs> we never know. The point is, say yes. When you sense the Spirit of God aligning things in your life, and you hear the voice of God leading you, say yes. It may be scary, so bring somebody with you. Sometimes it's good to have conversation partners. So if you're not part of a Sunday school class, I would encourage you to become part of a Sunday school class. If you can't really get to Sunday school, but you wanna be part of the Bi a Bible study, Talk to the Fall Habers. They have one that meets every Monday night. You'll find conversation partners there that will help you figure out what this call, this conversion experience you're having is. Maybe, maybe it's just talking with your relatives and your friends who are also followers of the way, and they can help you figure it out also just through random conversations. It's important that we do things. It's important that we show up to things like a conversation about mental health. You never know where that will lead. Or a movie about youth leading us into a better way of being. You never know what all of that is going to be. You just say yes. And in the saying yes, we find more and more grace. And it allows us to offer more and more hope. In the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. I think it's important also for us to remind one another what we believe because sometimes the world gets in the way, our ideas get in the way, our doubts, our struggles, our fears, all of those things get in the way and it's important that we remember what it is that we believe. So every Sunday we have an opportunity to practice telling people what we believe and reminding people what we believe and re remembering ourselves what it is that we believe. So we're about to say together the Apostles' Creed and you'll see on the screens that it says, I believe. Let's change the word I this morning to we. Central United Methodist Church, other followers of the way and friends of this church, what is it that you believe? We, we believe, believe in God, God the Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker, maker of, of heaven and earth, earth, and in, in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord, Lord who, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd, ask, I'd like to ask Kristen uh, Beaudry to come forward now. She is the executive director for 
El Paso, Texas, Las Cruces, New Mexico's um, branch of justice for our neighbors, as we like to call it, JFON. And uh, before she talks, I'd like to share a story with you. Is that okay, Kristen? Um, when I was serving down in Las Cruces, there's a little church down there called El Cavario United Methodist Church. It's this really tiny little congregation of people, and they are doing some absolutely amazing work with asylum seekers and refugees. They offer a place of hospitality for them until they can find, the, until they can get the resources together to get to their final destination in the United States. Well, sometimes people will stay there for two or three days and George Miller, their pastor, needs folks to come or used to need folks to come and stay the night with the asylum seekers there at the church. And lots of people for a while were really interested in being involved in that. And I never wanted to get in the way of a lay person doing ministry. So I told George, if you ever get stuck and you need somebody to stay the night, call me. But only call me if you're absolutely stuck and whatever I'm doing, I'll make sure I'm able to be there. So he called me one Saturday, called a preacher on a Saturday to stay the night someplace. And so I went. And there were two families there. There was a woman with a little girl who was about six or seven years old. And then there were, was another woman there and, uh, who had her husband with her also. And I played with that little girl. We played soccer with, uh, we started off with a, like a ball of socks and we ended up with a doll's head <laughs> down the hallway of the church. Language was not a barrier. We didn't speak the same language, but playfulness has no language. And the next morning I woke up and I was reading a book by Malcolm Geit. He's an Anglican priest and poet. That Sunday was Christ the King Sunday. And I read a sonnet on Christ the King Sunday that Malcolm Geit wrote. And it says, Our king is calling from the hungry furrows whilst we are cruising through the aisles of plenty. Our hoardings screen us from the man of sorrows. Our soundtracks drown out his murmur, I am thirsty. He stands in line to sign in as a stranger and seek a welcome from the world he made. We see him only as a threat, a danger. He asks for clothes. We strip search him instead. And if he should fall sick, then we take care that he does not infect our private health. We lock him in the prisons of our fear, lest he unlock the prison of our wealth. But still on Sunday, we shall stand and sing the praises of our hidden Lord and King. And as I was reading that, I could hear the sound of that little girl and her mom making breakfast for me. I want you to pay close attention to what Jafon is doing. Thank you so much. Good morning, my name is Kristen Bowdry. I am the Executive Director of Justice for Our Neighbors El Paso, and I'm also a United Methodist Deaconess. And I wanna thank Pastor Ross and Pastor Kelly for inviting me to come and share about the work of JFON. Um, I wanna share first a little bit about my personal background. I originally moved to El Paso in 2013 to be a full-time live-in volunteer at Annunciation House which is a Catholic worker style house of hospitality for immigrants and asylum seekers. During this time, I had many conversion experiences in relationship with the immigrants and asylum seekers that I lived with. These were families, men, women, and children who came to the US seeking safety and fleeing dangerous conditions in their home countries. They were looking for a better life for themselves and their children and they had an unwavering faith in the face of so much adversity that God would take care of them and that everything would work out for their good. They taught me so much and strengthened my faith and are very similar to the clients we serve today um, with JFON El Paso. For the past 10 years, I've been working with immigrants and asylum seekers in various capacities, and I could tell you many more stories of how this population has impacted me and changed my life converting me over and over again to the vision of the kingdom of God in which we express our love of God and neighbor by caring for one another. 
So I want to tell you a little bit now about Justice for Our Neighbors. Justice for Our Neighbors is a national network of 19 sites all over the country that grew out of UMCOR's longstanding commitment to refugees and immigrants. Since UMCOR's founding in 1940, refugee ministry has been at the heart of its work, guided by Christian values of hospitality to the stranger. UMCOR established Justice for Our Neighbors in 1999, and as I mentioned before, currently there are 19 sites all over the country. Each site is connected to an annual conference and JFON El Paso is the official JFON site of the New Mexico Annual Conference. JFON El Paso was organized with the assistance and support of the El Paso District Board of Missions, the Board of Directors formed in 2019, and we gained nonprofit status and joined the National JFON Network in 2021. Our mission is that we are a faith-based ministry providing affordable, high-quality immigration legal services and advocating for immigrants' rights in West Texas and Southern New Mexico. We are the newest JFON site, and we are only the second site on the border with the other border site being located in Tucson, Arizona. And our office is located at Trinity First United Methodist Church in downtown El Paso. We hired our first attorney in January, and she is currently representing asylum seekers detained at the four detention centers that operate out of the El Paso Immigration Court. We are working to secure their release from detention so that they can complete their immigration court proceedings in the community with their family rather than in detention. Our clients have told us horrendous things about the conditions inside of these detention centers, conditions which no asylum seeker or refugee who came to the US seeking safety should have to endure. And so we work for their release. We're also partnering with El Cavario in Las Cruces to expand immigration legal services in Las Cruces and Southern New Mexico. We are funded by the Texas Methodist Foundation, the New Mexico Annual Conference, the El Paso District Board of Missions, and individual donors. Um, there are a couple of different ways that I would like to invite you to get involved. Um, we could use your financial support we offer all of our services free of charge, and so to be able to do this, we need the support of individual donors. We are also looking for board members. If you or if you know anybody who would be interested in joining our board, our board meets via Zoom, and so you, it does not require travel to El Paso. Um, there are opportunities to write letters to our clients who are in detention centers if you are interested in that as well as if you have language skills, we can always use translation and interpretation. Um, I will be giving a longer presentation on May 15th at 2.30 at St. John's United Methodist Church. And so I invite all of you to attend that if you're interested in learning more. And I will also be sitting at the table in the Welcome Center for a few minutes after the service if you have any more questions or want any more information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. I would, I really would encourage you all to go visit her at her table and, and learn more about the work that JFON is doing. It is, it is kingdom work. It is, we pray that prayer, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and JFON is one of the places that is making that a reality. Uh, as the ushers get ready to come forward for our offering, I want to give you an opportunity to participate in the ministries that JFON is doing. Um, I often say that I don't really care where you give, I just care that you give, because I think generosity is a, a deep principle of discipleship, and so if you give to this church, we greatly appreciate that, and if you give to some other church, that's great also, because it will help you, or some other ministry, it will help you deepen your discipleship, because it breaks the ties of, of being possessed by our possessions, you know? And so if you want to give today to JFON, you can just write that in the memo of your check or if you're giving cash or something, you can place that in the envelope, uh, the, the, tie, the gift envelope and write JFON on there. It's just J-F-O-N. We'll make sure that they uh, receive those funds and you will get to participate in the releasing of captives. Think about that. I mean, that's one of the things Jesus said he came to do was to set the prisoners free. And so you get to participate in that work. 
if you partner with JFON. Let's pray. God, as we prepare to give money, we know that's not enough. But we ask you to take what we can give now and to multiply it and to use it for your kingdom here on earth. And because we know it's not enough, we ask that you would convert our lives over and over again and help us to find our voice so that we can use every breath that we take and every opportunity that we are given, every moment of our lives as an offering to you and multiply our efforts and use them for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. Redeeming God, we live in a world that is far too ready to say that you can't be found. Ready to choose punishment over mercy, judgment over compassion. Our world is too eager to put energy into exclusion rather than working to be inclusive of all your children. We confess to you that, like Saul, we have been blind, even in our sightedness, to what you are doing in the world. We need our eyes to be truly opened, Lord, to who you really are. Let our blindness fall away and let us see the good that we can do through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness to help usher in your kingdom here and now. 
May the gifts we give this morning be just the beginning of our availability to be your tools for bringing about the world you desire. We pray it in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We're about to uh, enter into the time that I come to church for, to be honest, this time of having communion together. And I want to remind you all, if you don't know this already, that in the United <laughs> Methodist Church, every single one of you is welcome to come and receive communion. Whatever it is that you may have been told before that may or may not exclude you from receiving communion, those things do not stand here. I heard this last week a friend of mine say, if something is true, you don't have to defend it, you just have to believe it. I believe that Jesus would welcome every single one of us to the table. But if for whatever reason you feel like it might be most best appropriate for you to stay in your seat and pray or meditate during this time, I want you to do that. Whatever you feel like you need to do to align your soul most with the Spirit of God in these next few moments, please feel free to do that. But you are welcome. Let us hear these words. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priest and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Family of God, we are the many that he was talking about. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here today and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we have named before you in our hearts and on our minds. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, 
now and forever. Amen. In case you're new here and nervous about what's about to take place, I'll explain it to you. As you, uh, the ushers will let you know when it's time for your pew row to come forward. And as you do, someone will offer you a wafer and remind you of its significance for us here this morning. And then someone will offer you, will, they'll be holding a tray, one of these brass trays that will have little cups of grape juice in it. And you'll take one of those little cups out and whoever offers it to you will remind you of its significance here as well. As you receive those things, you can say one of a few things. Some people say thank you, some people say amen, some people praise, say praise to God, those sorts of things. And some people in uh, the spirit of prayer and uh, will just not say anything. All of those things are appropriate. Um, you'll receive those. You can go down the sides here. You can kneel at the altar and pray if you would like. Um, and, there, uh, and then you can uh, go back to your seat. At the, end of e at the beginning of the outside rows, there are waste baskets where you can place those little plastic cups. The table is open, and I hope you know that you are welcome, but not obligated to come forward.
you pray with me? Oh God, as you have given yourself for us, grant that we may go forth and give ourselves for others. As we have received this bread and this juice, fill us with your spirit so that we can be your body broken for the world and your blood poured out in love. It's in Jesus' name we pray and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand to sing our closing hymn, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. this sacred place, creating sacred spaces for all who come into your midst so each and every person knows they are beloved child of God. And family of God, may your hearts find grace. May your souls know peace and may your minds be renewed. May your eyes see the light and your ears hear the glory of Jesus Christ in your midst. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning.